welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. We are uh, getting ready to wrap up what's been kind of a boring week, and I say boring in the sense that um, the market right now is exactly where it was a month ago, and yet in that time period, uh, we, we're up 1,200 points in the Dow in the last two weeks, and we were down 1,200 points in the Dow the two weeks before that. So it's boring because we're used to these 1,200-point two-week periods, and now this week I think we're down, you know, maybe 150, 200 points, but had a few up days, a couple down, one down day that made up most of that. So relatively speaking, not not a lot. You, you The news cycle has um, potential uh, hiccups in the North Korea talk. Markets have not even reacted um, we all know the non-ending stuff with uh, uh, Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, uh, her lawyer, you know, Comey and Mueller and all this stuff. And the um, markets have long now blown all that off. So you, you don't have a new cycle driven market. And, and we've talked over and over again about what is driving the market. And that most certainly is the tension point between growing earnings and rising interest rates. And the market's concerned as to where exactly rates be, stop to rise. And our opinion, as we articulated last week, is that uh, the notion of a new secular cycle of perpetually rising rates is not on the table. We're trying to find some normalization. The Fed would like to get the Fed funds rate um, uh, around 2.5%, get the, the tenure treasury uh, into the threes, um, and and see exactly what economic growth does from there, respond to data from there. But the idea that inflation has already gotten out of the barn, um, we, we don't see it in the data and, and we don't believe it. We understand the risk is a little more heightened. Um, so I think that that's kind of the uh, uh, overall paradigm driving the stock market, that tension point. But then you look around the world, there's a few other things we're talking about. I mean, as asset allocators, we are really enjoying the fact that alternative investments from your private equity to hedge funds to different things that are not correlated to the stock and bond market um, have, frankly, uh, given an opportunity to smooth equity market volatility and provide an absolute return even in a period where stock and bond returns have been negative, and we love for, for folks to reach out directly. We're not going to talk about individual hedge funds in this video, but give us a chance to talk about what exactly we're doing in that space because we're very pleased uh, with, with the alternative allocation we have in 2018 and, and believe that that will continue to be a spot investors want to consider. Um, one of our thesis is that it is a contrarian play. Hedge funds in the past have uh, had periods where they did very well relative to other risk assets. And then after that, money flew into hedge funds just in time for them to either not be necessary or, or not have performed as well. And then uh, money flows out of it and, and you, you know how the cycle goes. And 2012 to 2017 was a period in the PR uh, forums which hedge funds really took it on the chin. The alternative investing world was why, why uh, was was largely left for dead. Uh, fees were too high. The media said they were underperforming, and and now we believe it's entirely possible that history plays out again, where uh, both inflows into alternatives and outflows from alternatives uh, have have proven to be very poorly timed by an investing public. We're not going to let that happen. Uh, let me talk about Japan for a minute. They did report their first quarter of negative GDP growth in over two years, and yet the Nikkei is sitting at all-time high. Our thesis buying into Japan was very much a, a bottom-up story about corporate profits, which we think drive stock prices, not about uh, top-down economic strength. So no surprise in this at all and no, no uh, alteration in our thesis. In fact, basically a reinforcement of the same. Um, as far as emerging markets go, we're really reminded of how much we want an active approach that is bottom up in finding great companies around the world to invest in. 
versus buying the index, which I uh, uh, took note this week that 55% of the index now comes from just China, Taiwan, and South Korea, three of the largest exporters in the world. You can imagine how uh, cyclically correlated the index it is to global economic uh, conditions. Uh, in terms of capital expenditures, CapEx being this term that I'm using a lot these days, I wrote an article this week. You'll find it at DividendCafe.com. The link to it um, is there, this week's DividendCafe.com. And this is kind of where we're going to see over the next 12, 18, 24 months what happens of this bull market that began nine years ago. Well, could this become a 13, 15 year bull market? Or will we begin to run out of steam uh, in the economy? And that, I think, will largely come down to the ability to see business investment, business confidence, capital expenditures, capital goods orders uh, continue to grow. Businesses effectively voting their voter confidence in the sustainability of economic growth by investing in longer dated fixed assets, factories, plants, machinery, equipment, inventory, technology, uh, and all the data is indicating to us that this is working. We believe in the early stages of a CapEx revolution. But the reason I bring it up as not a foregone conclusion is because should that prove to not materialize, should the need for capital expenditures uh, uh, not come to fruition, the, the successful achievement thereof, um, then I believe that that does represent uh, a meaningfully bearish indicator and that it possibly gets to the point of exhausting this bull market. So it's something we're, we're watching very carefully and, and uh, we'll, we elaborate on that more in this article I'd love for you to read. So from CapEx to emerging markets, uh, oil prices continue to move. You've got to read DividendCafe.com to see a, a really interesting visual of, to, of, the, of the differential between global oil prices and what oil is selling for in the Permian Basin in West Texas. And what we think uh, is embedded in that story is the case for more pipelines that we desperately need, more energy infrastructure in this country. Um, and, and, and you'll see what I'm talking about there. Uh, so hopefully uh, we've covered a few things this week of interest to you. I do encourage you to reach out to us anytime you like, email, um, any questions, comments. Uh, you know, I don't talk about this much in the video, but from a social media standpoint, I, I don't do a whole lot with it myself, um, but I have a team that is very good. We have a whole communications department that's very good about getting our content out on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. So if you're already on some of those platforms, feel free to follow David Bonson or Bonson Group and 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 you might uh, find a new, easier way to get some of our content distributed. I just thought I'd mention that now. It kind of was in my mind. Um, but I'm going to get back into the market here. We've gone positive on this Thursday morning. So you know what that means. We have no idea what it means for the rest of today, Thursday, and on into the close of the week Friday. But uh, thank you for listening to Dividend Cafe this week. It'll be I'm um, excited to get a little weekend here in a couple of days. It's been a very busy week. And uh, we're, we're plugging away alternatives, dividend equity, uh, bonds that act like bonds, and emerging markets for growth. There's our themes. They were our themes a few months ago. They're most certainly still our themes now. Thanks for listening.